Thank you, Nicola, and thank all of you for coming. Before we start, I'd like to say uh, how much we appreciate what this sixth floor museum has become. It is one of the finest museum facilities in these United States now, and I have watched it as it grew from just collections from various ones of us who were connected with the assassination in one way or another. And now it has a professional staff of some of the best people in this country who are historians, who are at their heart educators, and who are in the business here of not just preserving the legacy of John F. Kennedy and the story of his tragic death, but instead are here for broader historical purposes in which this museum does Skype presentations all over the world. And uh, I myself have participated in a couple of these, speaking to a uniformed classroom of young men down in Australia, and we'll be doing uh, the national convention of the teachers of social studies here in the United States the day after the sad anniversary that we now approach. Uh, but kudos to this museum. Kudos and congratulations and thanks to the people who are on this staff who are in the business of safeguarding history and seeing to it that it is available to all and that it's available in responsible ways. All of us, I will say, uh, all of us who have covered this sad story uh, are a little sad at heart that the story has been so widely misinterpreted. Uh, I could go on at a great deal of length about that. Uh, if you saw the movie JFK, you saw Kevin Costner playing a very uh, sympathetic role as District Attorney Jim Garrison from New Orleans. Jim Garrison was on our afternoon uh, radio talk show at KRLD, and it didn't take us any longer than that one hour's time to conclude that this was a large, unprincipled, ignorant, nutty fellow. How do you feel about him? Uh, <laughs> let me go on. <laughs> no, I, I shouldn't. But uh, the movie, of course, is very well filmed. He took a great deal of trouble to repaint the window framing on this building, for example, for the filming of the movie, and then paint them back the color they had been when he uh, arrived in town. So there was a lot of meticulous work done in that way, but Kevin Costner was no Jim Garrison and Jim Garrison was no district attorney. And he certainly wasn't, well, I could go on. Um, so unfortunately, after a long period of time, I had just quietly concluded that uh, maybe we must have missed something back in 1963 and those immediate years following because 70 some odd percent of the American population believe that there is a wider conspiracy. We four do not. And that's because we were there in the first place and that we have studied it since that time. Uh, I had actually thought, well, we must have missed something and I had, I had uh, escaped quietly from broadcasting and become an English professor back then, so I kept my mouth shut, never told my classes what I had done. Uh, I knew I couldn't teach any English if I had done that. And so uh, I always thought it was a shame that there was such misunderstanding about this, and I also always knew somehow that I needed to write a book about it. But I couldn't write that book because I had not been everywhere. And between the four of us, we were just about everywhere. So because Wes, Bill, George, and I were good friends, and because in my judgment, these were some of the very top
people we had at KRLD News. And KRLD News was a good outfit to work for back then. We were one of the best operations in the Southwest. Mm -hmm. And these men are not just the empty-headed broadcaster who can pick up a microphone. These are people who covered their own news, who wrote it, who are good writers to this day, and who each wrote part of this book because I couldn't have written it all. They were places, they have viewpoints that I could never have had. And so, let me introduce some of the best people I know. To my immediate left is William Alfred Mercer. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> We have always said that Bill is the cute one. <laughs> <laughs> and he uh, hair. of course that, yeah. And he did look better with hair, but he's looking great without it too. We're all getting a little thin on top, except Wes, of course. And uh, he just says, well, he doesn't come to town to get a haircut that often now. Uh, but thanks to Bill Mercer, uh, Many of you perhaps remember Bill from doing wrestling broadcasts as a wrestling announcer who was once hoisted and thrown around on the stage and passed around by giant wrestlers. Uh, oh. Bill was actually once one of the top television personalities in Israel while he was doing the uh, wrestling broadcasts. Yeah, shalom. <laughs> <laughs> but he also is the patriarch of many beautiful granddaughters and uh, many beautiful children as well and uh, is one of the sharpest of all of our reporters. A play-by-play -play man is also a good newsman. Wes was one of these too. And the next gentleman uh, sitting there, the man who refuses ever to wear a tie, and that will be uh, on uh, George Phoenix's epitaph, it's all right because uh, he's always been this way and that's one of the reasons we love him. Uh, when I first decided that George Phoenix was an interesting man, it was when I heard him do a traffic report for me that I was recording when I was uh, doing some radio stuff in the afternoon. And George reported from a terrible uh, uh, traffic jam and he had made his way to a telephone booth and at the end of the report, he said, I'm reporting from a telephone booth far from the uh, fuming motorists and fuming exhausts. I like it here. <laughs> <laughs> and from then on, I decided, Phoenix is not your average fellow. <laughs> he was our youngest reporter here in town with KRLD. And probably the most resourceful and brash young man I have ever met. I thought I was brash and resourceful, but Phoenix, uh, but he'll tell you more about that. And on your far right is the gentleman that we call his former honor. <laughs> <laughs> but he's got plenty of it for the rest of us. Wes, Wesley Arthur Wise, a man who came from Shreveport, Texas to Beaumont and then up here to Dallas was not only one of the best reporters we had, one of the best people I've ever known, who wrote for Life magazine, for uh, Sports Illustrated, who proved to all the print journalists in town that broadcast journalists are just as literate and we write too. Wes was even president of the Dallas Press Club on that account. And he was the man who escorted Adlai Stevenson the day of that embarrassment incident that he'll tell you about. So without going on any further, I'll tell you, we'll go in our uh, same order. Would you please give my three amazing co-authors the hand that they deserve? Be thinking of questions that you might like to ask us because about 2.35, uh, we'll take them up from you You're on your question sheets and I will attempt to read them and 
we'll all attempt to answer. So let me start and say that one of the times that I finally cried over this sad case was when I was watching Bill Mercer on the green out front among the flowers that accumulated there with the cards from people all over the United States and some from other countries. Bill somehow managed to read those cards and to talk about the people who were gathered there. Would you tell us more about that, Bill? It was rather like everything we did suddenly. Uh, they would give us, if they gave us something to do, we did it, even though we'd maybe never done it before. Uh, uh, and I think that was one of the things that the four of us still marvel at uh, is uh, going out without a director, without a floor man, with maybe a cameraman, and doing the story. There was an engineer and a studio camera. That's when the news did go live, back to our studios and onto CBS. I had a, a microphone. Uh, my dear engineer uh, was there, and that was it. I had nobody, no direction. I had no bug in my ear for anybody to tell me. My instinct and by maybe being a sports reporter as well as a news reporter, you went after the guys to interview. The flowers was thrust on me, and I, and, and, uh, I mean, you don't say no, you just go do it. And I was thinking as I was looking at that and all the people, and I said, this is going to be a test. How am I going to maintain my composure? And I don't think I breathed much. I was trying to keep my voice a little tense so that I didn't just break down. Uh, some of those statements were as personal as a human being can give to somebody who's just been killed. So it was, it was and I, I see it occasionally on tape, that, uh, and I kind of look at it and think, I don't know how I did that. But that's what we had to do. We had to be called on and do these things. Uh, you want me to go on or anything? Or? Well, no, go we'll back. come back around to you. Okay. And uh, in the like meantime, and we'd go. it was a tough story to cover. It was. It was, it was hard to save our tears for private times <laughs> and still keep reporting. George Phoenix was our newest reporter. And uh, George managed to do some things <laughs> in those days that uh, a lesser fellow could not have pulled off. Uh, I, at least, most of the time had a mobile unit at my disposal. George Phoenix was out there with a camera, a notepad, and an attitude, <laughs> <laughs> which started out that day at the trademark, where he was waiting for the president to arrive. I got punched out four times that year. That might have been my personality. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, at the trademark, I was supposed to film the Kennedys as they r rolled in. My boss, Eddie Barker, was inside doing the live pool broadcast. Um, our communications devices were very simple in those days. Uh, we had, uh, in the mobile news units, had a little microphone and radio. I was on foot, so I didn't have anything. The lady in the crowd started crying, said, he's been hit, he's been hit. And I said, who? She said, the president's been hit. And I thought, rock, bottle, I never thought gun. And out of the corner of my eye, well, sirens were going over on Stimmons Freeway, and. I kind of figured that might be them. They were probably headed to the hospital. I was going to be stuck there at the trademark because Eddie, my boss, wasn't going to look for me. He was going back to direct the news. Um, so I, I, I found instincts I didn't know I had until that point. A general was running out of the trademark into his car where he had a driver 
And I yelled at him. I said, where are you going? And he said, I'm going to Parkland. I said, I'm going with you. I don't know what made me do that, but I jumped in the car with him, and he was pounding the back seat, and he said, they shot him. They shot the son of a bitch. <clears throat> and about that time, I was festooned with White House press credentials. He knew I was a reporter, but it finally sunk in on him that I was. And I think he wanted to throw me out, but we were doing 90 miles an hour. Um, got to the hospital, and Secret Service had closed off access. Fortunately, Bob and Warren Fulks were already inside, and they were feeding radio. Uh, I was filming the scrum outside, uh, the priest as they walked up. Um, the uh, a kid came up with a big roll of film, 125, 150, whatever, the, and he's flipping it like that. Just kept, and finally an AP photographer said, "What do you got, kid?" And he said, "I don't know. I was on a telephone pole shooting pictures at the triple underpass, and the AP guy peeled out a hundred bucks and gave it to him, which was a fortune in <laughs> in those days, 50 years ago." Uh, we never saw a print one. That kid just worked a very quick con. <laughs> <laughs> the Secret Service um, decided that there might be a conspiracy, so they started moving us all back away from the entrance. And I knew that my lens wouldn't reach that far. So I broke from the crowd and ran uh, across the open area into the wing of the hospital. The whole time I was running, I thought, I hope they don't shoot me. And I'm surprised, really, that they didn't. Uh, got inside, uh, ran up to a patient's room, burst open the door, and I said, I'm press, I need that window. And to my astonishment, they let me stand up there. And I filmed uh, Ms. Kennedy coming out in her pink dress, pink pillbox. It was tough for all of us, and uh, I think at one point uh, George was knocked down by Major General Edwin Walker, what, three times, and, uh, and Jack Ruby's brother uh, attacked George, and uh, there's not time for George to tell the whole story, but George was as aggressive as anybody, so he ended up chasing Ruby's brother uh, back into the courthouse. So I told you I like George for good reason. Now, the joke about your former honor, of course, is, uh, is a joke. Because thanks to Wes Wise, Dallas regained its reputation. Wes was the first truly independent mayor that this city had had for decades. And I remember thinking when Wes was elected mayor, they got him a real guy. I mean, they got him a real person in there. And sure enough, that's what he was and is to this day. Being that mayor was not all that way, not that easy, right, Wes? How about that uh, mayor's conference you were talking about? Uh, well, I'd, I'd like to uh, do my comments into three parts. Sure. Before, during, and after. All right. Uh, one month before JFK was to have arrived in Dallas, uh, Adley Stevenson was here for UN Day meeting um, at the at the uh, convention center. That's almost within one of a few blocks up here. And after the uh, the event was going on. We were saying this. This is an electric atmosphere. There's something wrong here in the in the in the place. That a, a, a man who identified himself as being with the <coughs> National Indignation Committee was uh, mounting off. And Adley Stevenson made one of his classic remarks: uh, "Sir, do I have to come from Illinois to teach Texans good manners?" And of course, he got a big round of applause for for setting that guy straight. But it was an electric atmosphere. It was getting to be about 20 minutes until 10. And uh, Underwood, who did the weather, said, Wes, uh, you're going to have to stay here and take p pictures of uh, 
of Ambassador Stevenson leaving. And uh, I said, well, well, fine, I would do that. Uh, I was obeying the assistant news director, uh, his orders. And uh, by the way, he later became my campaign manager. Uh, and uh, sure enough, as uh, Stevenson was leaving, he went over to what is called the rope line to speak to a group of people, Val M, who was then a society editor. That was when, back in the days when you had society editors of the Dallas Times Herald was there to greet him. And a woman came from behind and swung a placard over the side of uh, Stevenson and hit him here on the side of the head and the ear. And he said, uh, Madam, uh, wh what can I do for you? What, what's the matter? And she gave some kind of uh, inane remark like, well, if you don't know, I'm not going to tell you. And of course, that accomplished absolutely nothing. I've thought back upon it now. That became an exclusive picture that was uh, set all over the, the nation on Associated Press. Uh, I was assigned to, uh, to try to trace Lee Harvey Oswald's steps as he escaped the school book depository building, this building right here. And uh, I was sitting over here uh, in the KRLD station wagon with KRLD over on the side, and I saw a man in a, in a fedora hat that later became famous, uh, kind of uh, half uh, trotting and half waddling over toward the news wagon, and it was Jack Ruby. Now, he was there uh, coming from behind the, the building uh, on the day after the uh, assassination and the day before he was to shoot uh, Lee Harvey Oswald in the, in the basement of City Hall the next day, or the, the, at the jail the next day. Uh, as a result of that, I was called as a, as a witness for the prosecution and for the uh, defense, for the prosecution to raise the question, what was Jack Ruby doing here at this site uh, on the day after the assassination? For the defense on uh, the fact that tears came to his eyes and he showed emotion. Uh, the, that's the, the middle. Uh, by the way, I, I, uh, I was told just recently, uh, during this 50th anniversary, that as far as is known, I'm the only person who was a witness for both the prosecution and the defense in the Ruby trial. I haven't researched that yet, so I'm not sure of that. Uh, ten years after, I was, uh, had been elected mayor, and which was, of course, quite an honor to me and quite a surprise to many people. And I was at a, a ten year later meeting of the U.S. Conference of Mayors in Chicago. This was 1973, exactly ten years later, and of course I was being interviewed by a lot of the media about how Dallas had changed over those ten years. And at the end of the, one of the day's meetings, a group of uh, the big city mayors were standing around having uh, uh, cocktails, and, and in the course of conversation, one of the mayors said, uh, uh, Mayor Wise, uh, how does it feel to be mayor of the city that killed the president? And I was told that I clenched my fist. I don't remember doing this, but I was told that I had clenched my fist. And of course, the worst thing that I could have done in the name of Dallas would, would, would have been to try attack the mayor who had insulted the city. But uh, later, uh, during that conversation, the mayors, the other mayors came and I said, that was a dirty thing to say, and that could have happened in any of our city, and we all know that. And he knows that. And the next morning, the mayor who said that to me came and said, boy, have I heard it from my fellow mayors who were in that meeting. He said, uh, I just want to apologize. and." and ask your forgiveness for making that remark and extended his hand and of course I shook his hand and I said I accept your apology. It certainly is and uh, we promise not to cause you, call you a flip-flopper for testifying for both sides uh, in the <laughs> trial. Uh, you might actually uh, Wes had been uh, had been collared by Jack Ruby and uh, I, I think I need to tell, uh, tell you that Bill had the most difficult assignment of November the 22nd, I think, of all of us, uh, later in the day. And by the way, I ended up with that same assignment for the next several days, that is, the Dallas Police Headquarters, where hundreds of reporters from all over the world had uh, converged. Uh, Bill was there the night of the assassination the same night that 
the Dallas police finally brought Oswald out to show that he was not being beaten. And that was something that was being, a, being, a, 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 being leveled against the Dallas police uh, by reporters who thought that perhaps these were southern lawmen in the mold of Bull Connor. Uh, not so, thank goodness. Uh, Bill was on that third floor when they began to converge. And when we had gotten our mobile television capability set up in Dallas Police Headquarters with cables this big around running in through the chief of police's window and across his office and down the hall. Go ahead, Bill. It was, uh, you know, like... Eddie Barker, our news director, said, okay, Bill, you haven't been doing anything today. Uh, and these guys are tired. Go over to the police station and do what you can do over there with the scene. Uh, that was it. You know, just go do it. And as I said, we didn't have any directions after we, re after we arrived at what we were supposed to do. We just sort of said, okay, this is the way it's going to be done. The third floor was pretty quiet when I first arrived. I always thought it was a fairly wide hallway, but it, it really is about as wide as these squares here. It was just immediately very tiny for all the people that ultimately <laughs> came in. So uh, our engineer set up the uh, camera at the end of the, uh, on the other end. I had a microphone, one of the old-fashioned kind, about that long, and a lot of cable. I was stringing the cable down the side of the wall so I could maneuver around and hope the guys wouldn't pull it out. This very <coughs> large guy with a bunch of uh, little cameras all over his body. He <laughs> uh, the personification of the uh, news guy running around taking pictures. He came up to me and he said, uh, what's that cable? I said, well, that's my cable from my, f my live broadcast with this microphone. And he said, well, I'll tell you if, you, if that cable gets in my way, I'll just yank it out. And George is quick to jump sometimes, and I sort of had a temper, and I said, and you do, and I'll break this microphone over your head. <laughs> <laughs> so the engineer came down and said, you okay? I said, oh, yeah, I'm fine. Uh, that's just the first part. After that, uh, because we had a newsroom of variety of people, uh, we all got to know the police chief and, the, and all the uh, lieutenants, one of those, uh, Jerry Hill was our uh, uh, traffic, traffic reporter. Traffic. Yeah, can't think of the name. Well, our traffic man, so Jerry is the one, along with Arch McDonald, who captured Lee Harvey Oswald in the Texas Theater. When they came up, I went over and interviewed them. As I started moving around and more people came in, the guys who didn't know anybody started following me. I was kind of like a Pied Piper. And I would move over, and I'd have my little crowd follow me, and then they'd take over. And that was the whole job that night, was try to do interviews, uh, stay with the focus, like the holding up the, the uh, rifle. And you couldn't interview Mrs. Oswald or Marina, but uh, they came in, and we had pictures. And it, you know, it was really a, uh, a throng of, of, of thuggery. <laughs> As, as George said, uh, people pushing and shoving and elbowing. There was a picture I was tuned in one night and I was uh, looking at, I said, oh, that's a hallway. I wonder where I am. And I was looking around. The people came out, the door closed. I had been pushed behind the door. <laughs> <laughs> Another time I'm yelling, I am being pummeled. I'm being pummeled. I don't know why I said that because it really didn't make any difference that I was pummeled, but for some reason I said it. So that went on from 6.37 until <clears throat> midnight. Oh, by the way, uh, Jack Ruby, I learned, was down there in the mob handing out sandwiches or cookies or something. I never saw him, and I didn't get a sandwich or a cookie. So, uh, but he was there. Uh, then they announced that they were going to have the great, uh, and go, going back first, the police bent over backwards to help these people when they came through, answer questions, thrown at them. I mean, you, you can imagine, if all of you were surging up here as reporters, and you can't imagine that you would be that incompetent, but they, they all were yelling and yelling and yelling, and the police would stop and explain something. They were very cooperative. They were trying to be, say, look, we had nothing to do with this. Uh, we're trying to give you every opportunity to learn the story, and it was 
I thought they were well uh, handled. Uh, Bob Schieffer was in Fort Worth. You know Bob, the guy on Sunday morning. A real good guy. And he was a little reporter at the Star-Telegram. His phone rang that evening and the uh, lady said, uh, uh, I need a ride to Fort Worth. And Bob said, well, we're not in the... To Cat Dallas. Huh? To Dallas. To Dallas, yeah. I don't need... Uh, we don't, we're not in the business of cabs. We're just news reporters. She said, well, my name is Marina, um, Mrs. Oswald, and I'm the f mother of the guy they charged with the murder of the president. And Bob said, well, we'll work at this. <laughs> he didn't have a, enough uh, a car to do it, but he got somebody else. They drove over. He escorted Mrs. Oswald in, into the detective's office, and then slipped over to the side. Bob, al uh, Chief always wore a, a, a reporter's hat. He always wanted to look like a reporter. So they started talking, the detectives and all that, and then one of them glanced over and saw Bob and said, who are you? And he said, oh, I'm a reporter from the Star-Telegram. And he get the hell out of here, you know. <laughs> Just little things like that. Everybody tried to do something or tried to do the right thing. Uh, so they announced at uh, midnight they were going to have a press conference. Now, today that would be unthinkable. But back then, again, trying to be cooperative, the police wanted to let these guys ask questions of this uh, alleged killer who, by the way, was kind of disappointing as a killer. He was very nobody looking. And I looked at him, I thought, he is the guy that would shoot somebody? He didn't have any, any anything. He's just a cipher. So the engineers took the camera downstairs and ran the cable down there so that they'd be, and that's the front of our book, is the camera KRLD, that's why we put it on the uh, front cover, not because I'm standing by the camera, I mean by the, yes, by the camera, or that Gene Pashalik was behind the camera, but they wanted KRLD uh, as our station on the front. As I was prepared to go downstairs, one of the detectives, somebody <coughs> told me, uh, we're preparing, uh, they're preparing the uh, papers to charge Lee Harvey Oswald. He's going to be charged tonight. I said, oh. Uh, very soon. He'll be charged when he comes back upstairs. I said, okay. I didn't think anything about it using what he told me, but that was fine. So they brought in Oswald, and it lasted, what, about 40 seconds, 45 minutes and 30, that people just started yelling and screaming, yelling and screaming. And while Oswald tried to talk, they were yelling, 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 yelling. So nobody knew how to run a press conference <laughs> of an alleged killer in those days. So. He, they would shut that down, and Lee Harvey turned to leave, and a reporter next to me said, have you been charged with anything? And Oswald said, no, I haven't been charged with anything, and went into a little bit about how he needed help and this and that. And I said to him, yes, you have been charged with the murder of the president. And there was this little hesitation. What? And I said, yes, you have been charged with the murder of the president. And he looked at me and turned and walked out. Uh, I was not kneeling as I thought all those years. I was standing at the front of the camera. He just happened to be right there. So that was my conversation with Lee Harvey. He said, what? And I told him. Those it, were tough times at that police station. Oh, man, it was awful. I it want to take time to remind you, uh, please uh, go ahead and fill out your questions on your question sheets, if you don't mind. and. See if you can uh, get those into the hands of uh, the staff who are picking those up now. Uh, it was, as I said, a tough thing to cover all that, and Bill did yeoman service down there at police headquarters. Uh, that said, I took uh, over for him there at police headquarters the next day and ended up broadcasting the shooting of Oswald live on CBS. And that was another strange scene. Uh, we had, uh, and by the way, Bob Schieffer wore those uh, snap brim hats <laughs> because he wanted to look like a cop, not like a reporter. And when he brought uh, Marguerite Oswald in, he said, do you have some place uh, where I could put uh, Mrs. Oswald so that these reporters can't get to her? 
<laughs> and uh, Chief is still gutsy as he can be. Uh, and thank goodness he's, uh, he greets us on Sunday mornings. Uh, thank goodness. Uh, I'll start out right now with, uh, w with w our first question, which I do believe that we'll all want to take a crack at. Bill Funderburk asks, do you see any parallel between the vitriolic hatred shown to President Kennedy and what appears to be a similar hatred for President Obama in some parts of Texas and the United States? Wes? I believe that uh, President Obama, whatever your political beliefs may be, Democratic, Republican, etc., uh, I do think that the man is trying to do as good a job. And after all, he was reelected pretty overwhelmingly. And uh, so the, the majority of the people of various political views uh, uh, still re realize that he is a second term president. Uh, I think it would be a shame to uh, allow any kind of animosity toward a president or any other record uh, uh, a political office holder to be the, the, the uh, object of hatred or of anything that could cause violence again. I'll tell you right now, as a former public official myself, you're going to have fewer and fewer people be willing to put themselves and their families uh, on the line and run for public office. And if that happens, a democracy just can't, can't continue to exist. George. In my speckled past, um, I was chief of staff for Congressman Pickle in Washington for four years. And Things were competitive between Democrats and Republicans in the early 70s, but we got together and had a beer after work. Uh, it wasn't like it is now. I don't know what to do about those things. I, th I think they're going to have to play themselves out, but it, I've never seen it. I've been in press or politics for 50 years, and I've never seen it as mean as it is right now. I, I would echo that. Bill? Uh, we had a program called Comment on KRLD, and every group in town, and that was one thing that set up Dallas, were all these various groups from the right to the left in the middle. Uh, and they all got on, uh, tried to get on, put some representative on to make a case. Uh, I think one of the best known was the Birch Society, and then the John Birch Society. And then there were other groups that were uh, equally as obnoxious. Uh, for example, uh, one day we had a fellow who came on, said he had information about communists in our government. And as he started interviewing, he said that uh, he had proof that uh, President Eisenhower had been, a, uh, had been a communist. There was no question about it. Now, that was live on the air. And we said, well, what's your, what's your facts? Well, what, what is the the thing that you can show us. Well, I can't, it's classified. So we took a break, and the four of us, uh, Eddie Barker, Jim Underwood, I, and whoever else was in there, went outside and said, we can't have this kind of stuff. Uh, he's either gotta give us some evidence, or we'll just say goodbye. So we went back in, said, sir, uh, you have uh, said, uh, told us that uh, Dwight Eisenhower was a communist. Now, Give us the facts. Give us some evidence. Well, I can't do that. You just have to, and this and that, and started off much like some of these guys do today. So we said, sir, thank you very much for coming, and you're ready to go now. <laughs> we had a lot of phone calls about that. You can imagine from which side that was. Uh, the news uh, agencies, would, some of them might do that today, but I don't think so. Uh, they seem to revel in uh, allowing these people to uh, view, uh, give all this stuff. Uh, of course, there's one network that is uh, uh, famed for fair and news, but uh, it, it's really gotten out of hand, and as George said, it's cable. But I really think, basically, from somewhere, and uh, I hate to mention this, but from the day one, because Obama defeated their war hero in Vietnam, and because he was black, You've got to take that into consideration. That's why they don't like him. 
And that's why they hate him. And that's why they said they would never help him. So, yeah, it's turned really bad today. We had some, but nothing like this. That's true. Uh, politics has always had its dirty side. But uh, after this assassination, all of us, and perhaps everyone in Dallas, thought about politics for a while. <laughs> and we thought about the politics of hatred. We sort of thought we were through with that for a while. But it's back. Teach your children about facts. And fair and balanced does not mean that you report two opposite sides of some question, neither of which is all that wonderful. <clears throat> and perhaps one side is true and the other is a lie. But you go right ahead and report that anyway. If that is fair and balanced, then I've got a couple of used cars to sell. Here is the question that has uh, uh, has followed us all, I guess, and that is how did covering this affect your life? Wes, what do you think about that? Looking back on it, I didn't think this at the time, frankly, when I made the decision to run for first for city council and then for mayor. Uh, looking back on it, that those 1960s were turbulent. Uh, first of all, the assassination of President Kennedy. Then it was Bobby Kennedy. Then it was Dr. Martin Luther King. Uh, this was all in the 60s. Uh, and the Vietnam War was unbelievably out of, out of hand. And it was in 1968 that I made my decision to run for the city council in 69. Looking back on it, I have to say uh, that, that all of those events coming together at the, at the time uh, had to do with, with my decision to, to get into public office. George, you were probably our first uh, connection with politics back then because George left uh, KRLD to become a lobbyist for the Texas Municipal League in Austin. And later he founded and published Texas Weekly, which is to this day the premier newsletter about Texas politics. So with that in mind, George Phoenix, what do you think about how things have gone? I haven't been active as a reporter in 20 years, I guess, but I still carry a pen and paper to write on. <laughs> and I've counted the room so I can say, in case there's an explosion, yes, 80 people burned to death. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> it, it made me uh, very skeptical. Uh, I kept looking for backstories. You know, what's the real in in politics, in in family life, in everything? And it it, it was a burden. Uh, it, there are still times when I I, I feel like ah, uh, but. It, it I'm, I'm still, I'll never get over being jaded. Bill, how does it feel to have been what you have been all these years and have done this? Well, wait till they tell them what I've been. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I stayed around uh, to 64, that was 63 and then 64, and I left uh, the news business in the hands of Bob and others and Wes. And, uh, threw myself on these, the uh, gods of money, professional sports broadcasting, or, uh, or foot, uh, anything football. And I, I was lucky in that I uh, became the cowboy announcer, and I just didn't want to uh, think back on that anymore, and uh, never paid much attention to anything that we did uh, in the film or anything. It, uh, it solidified my idea that if I'm going to report something, I want to make it entertaining. Uh, I don't want to talk about death. I don't want to talk about degradation. 
And uh, although the Dallas Cowboys may be deaf, I don't know. <laughs> uh, but I had some pretty bad teams to broadcast, but you take that in hand. So I changed my whole career, and then I finally did. I started teaching at the University of North Texas, which was probably in my estimation, uh, and I got him up to come up there and get a PhD uh, in teaching, and it was my, you know, broadcast sports. But I just walked, I just tuned in this morning, and a game was on, and one of my ex-students was doing the game. And so uh, that, I think, was the greatest contribution to give back to those kids who, uh, kids who are now out and able to do more than I ever did, and I'm very proud of them. So I'm proud of the fact that I turned away from it, and uh, I still got irritated and write letters about the political situation, but I stay away from it, basically. Still writes well, too. <laughs> uh, here's a, uh, just an out-and-out -out statement. Are you concerned that the negative politics of today might lead to another presidential assassination? Well, I've, I've expected at least an attempt. I'm surprised that uh, with the people that we won't have to mention in the backgrounds and our wonderful gun laws today, everybody seems to be armed. How in the world is that man avoided, thank God, being shot at at least? And uh, well, I'm, I, I, would, I worried every time I saw him out in public. Wes? Um, I'd like to get off another subject. If I okay. Uh, this building is very unique. And uh, John Connolly, who was in the car, as you well know, and was wounded at the same time uh, the president was shot and killed, uh, spoke to me at one time on the telephone when there was a very serious move, a very serious move to destroy this building, to literally tear it down. And John Connolly was with me on the telephone, and he said, Wes, please, whatever you can do to, to avoid tearing down that building, see to it that it's done. Uh, the city of Dallas is already being accused of being part of a conspiracy. The Dallas Police Department is already being accused of being part of a conspiracy. If that building is torn down, people who believe in the conspiracy angle of the assassination are going to swear that the city tore that building down so that there would not be evidence in the future that the city of Dallas and the Dallas Police Department were involved in the assassination. So I wanted to mention that these very bricks that hold this building together uh, could easily have been a part of the, and, and, and John Connolly himself was a victim of, of that shot, uh, could easily have been used in, in, in the conspiracy issue. But here's the man right here who saved this building. He didn't say that, but he did save the building. Yeah. Yeah. Appreciate that, Bill. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have a question here. Uh, did uh, any of you have anything to do with the movie Parkland? Uh, for me, no, I did not. Although, I think that got me kicked off of the Colbert Report. Uh, <laughs> they decided to do that instead. And uh, I told them I really couldn't think of any assassination jokes at all. So, um, yeah, you can't think that. <laughs> let's see. Uh, here is this uh, question uh, that really requires perhaps more answering than we have uh, resources to do, and that was an argument over the classroom of children here in Dallas, supposedly, who cheered when they heard that the president had been shot. Uh, let me give you a quick and, I think, uh, terminal uh, treatment of that. That became uh, the crux of an argument between Dan Rather and our news director, Eddie Barker. That was such an argument that when Dan uh, broadcast that information and Eddie was incensed because he did not believe the story, I think looking at those two whom we all respect, uh, they had an honest difference of opinion. But uh, our news director, Eddie Barker, had a temper that was legendary. 
He kicked trash cans entirely across our newsroom on occasion, and he uh, ejected the entire uh, news, I mean, the entire CBS news crew from our newsroom as a result thereof. And he and Dan never did agree on that story. I suspect that there was a great deal of truth on both sides. Eddie's children went to that school, and he knew that his class, their classes, had not done so. And Bill did a special interview with one of the teachers there who denied that anything like that had happened. But the latest information Bill has received, he told me very recently. Yeah, 50 years later. 50 years later, maybe Dan Rather was right. Uh, one of my ex-students, uh, who lives in California and is in the news business, emailed me one day and said, hey, this uh, 50th anniversary is coming up. What are you guys doing? And we, I said, well, you know, this and that. We don't have to deal with the children thing and something else. And she said, oh, I went to that school. And that happened. I swear it happened. And she was adamant about it. I called her and then talked to her. And she said, uh, the <laughs> now this is her take. I quote her. The University Park area was really the homegrown ground for the Burt Society. That's her take. She was, I don't know how old she was, but she was a middle uh, grade school kid. And she said she was, uh, she always remembered that and uh, that it was uh, of something that some people thought didn't happen, others did, and it actually did, in her estimation in, in the part of the school that she was in. Anyway, you know, you probably find somebody who says no. Well, I think of the kid who came home uh, and crying and went to the neighbors because his family wasn't there and said, uh, I'm looking for my daddy. And they said, well, he's at work. He said, I know, but I think he's the guy that killed Kennedy. Uh, those attitudes, that's the kind of attitude that we're talking about that was around in those days. So perhaps parents who think a little deeper about it will remember your children are listening <laughs> and they're watching you thank you ever so much for caring about this story caring enough about how this fits into the pattern of American history how this museum has brought itself to the fore and is doing its job to help history uh, you have all heard the axiom that people who ignore history are bound to repeat it. We have seen uh, some cycles take place over these 50 years, and today is not a time of ease in this country. So perhaps history is more important than we have all recognized. How, how did you come to the title? Oh, the title of our book, When the News Went Live. George is smart enough to ask me to try to plug the book. <laughs> I don't have so it. I will say this. It was the day that the news went live. Yeah. Uh, we had not used mobile television capabilities to broadcast news from the scene before that very day. It was just simply not done. Did football. One month before the assassination, when Wes was there covering the embarrassing situation with our United Nations ambassador, we were also broadcasting that live on KRLD television. But when the disturbance broke out in that auditorium, our director, Lee Webb, who knew exactly what he was doing, had all of our cameras tilt up so that they would avoid the unseemly display Lee Webb was our director, and he was making a good television program, not covering the news. So as a result, we have no tapes of what those people were doing. And believe you me, uh, we were embarrassed too. <laughs> Dallas was not a city of hate. We all know that. We knew it at the time. But I must say that our particular nuts were more conspicuous and meaner than most of the nuts of the day. And this was before we began to elect 
nuts to public office. Uh, <laughs> uh, Gentlemen, I'd, 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 I'd just like to say one more thing on a, on a different note. I've been on both sides of journalism and anti-journalism as a, as a public official. I have never talked to a person who covered the assassination of President Kennedy in Dallas, Texas, uh, radio, TV side, or newspaper, or magazine side, who didn't admit that at some time during the coverage, he or she had to get off in a corner and cry. I've never heard one that would not admit that. Mm -hmm. uh, I just wanted to mention that on the behalf of journalists who covered that story.